Eh, va, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Let me know. We we are. Uh... Okay. So, welcome to this webinar that is organized by Air Charter International and the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. This is the first time these two organizations join forces to organize an event, and we're really excited to come together to this topic today, which is towards a UN Declaration of the Rights of, of Modern Nature, bridging ethical sustainability and the recognition of nature rights. So my name is Alicia Jimenez. I work at Air Charter International based in Costa Rica at the University for Peace Campus. This is where I am here today. And so this webinar aims at building upon the Stockholm Plus 50 international meeting outcomes, particularly linked to three Stockholm Plus 50 principles of engagement, which were intergenerational responsibility, interconnectivity, and implementing opportunity and the process towards a, a UN Declaration of Rights of, uh, of Mother Nature. So we hope to highlight the crucial role of interconnection and networking on a global scale, and the role of ethical frameworks such as the Earth Charter in order to take action for planetary well-being and reassessment of nature-based worldviews. So, the plan of today is the following. We'll hear some introductory remarks from Miriam Vilela, who is the Executive Director of Earth Charter International Secretariat and the Center for Education for Sustainable Development here at the University for Peace. And then we'll join, a, we'll enjoy a panel discussion with our special guest of today, who will be addressing questions from the moderator, uh, Francisca Benz, who will be with us. Uh, and we'll also address some questions from all of you, uh, the, the audience. So please share your questions with us if you're following here in Zoom or in live stream. Okay, so that's the plan. And I'm really excited that we're starting today. So without further ado, let's welcome Miriam Vilela. Miriam. Thank you, Alicia. And hello, everyone. I'm very happy to see you and to be with you here today for this conversation on a very important topic um, and what we our intention is to really offer this as a space to clarify what's going on in terms of uh, this very important idea that I think has to do with expanding our views and our understanding with regards to to nature and how we relate to nature so uh, let me just briefly share with you um, a few thoughts on the Earth Charter. Uh, as many of you know, the Earth Charter was launched in the year 2000 after many years of research and consultation around values and principles that could guide us towards a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. Uh, but the research part of it uh, involved actually research on uh, instruments of international law, international environmental law, that were already existing and emerging um, over the many years prior to the Earth Charter. So we could actually look at the Earth Charter as something that brings together uh, piles of international environmental law and uh, sort of summarize this in a nutshell. Um, so I think that's actually one very useful role the Earth Charter play but we could look at it as, as, an, as an instrument, as an ethical reference, uh, an ethical framework or foundation uh, to guide us towards a more flourishing, regenerative, uh, sustainable future. But for me, uh, one of the key roles the Earth has been playing uh, in actually its purpose is to expand and deepen our consciousness, expand and deepen our consciousness. Uh, the way we see things and how, how we perceive things with regards to the community of life. So this notion of the community of life exists. We are part of this community of life. What does, what does that mean, feeling a part of the community of, of life and making this notion of community of life 
uh, alive and visible. Um, and not only that, but also uh, I think the Rashara serves uh, us or invites us, encourages us to think about how we ought to relate with and between ourselves and the large living world, as it's uh, clearly indicated and articulated in principle 16F of the Earth Charter, uh, which uh, that principle encourages us to think about our relationships, uh, our relationships not only with human beings, but also with nature and the large living world. Therefore, the vision that is articulated I think in the Earth Charter helps us to move beyond this predominant anthropocentric approach uh, to a more life-centric, biocentric approach to life. Um, so it, it really involves a change of mindset and worldviews uh, that I think has been helping us even to articulate in other spheres uh, over the last uh, 20 years. For instance, I, I would like to give two other examples that are not explicitly or limited to, to our relationship to nature, but it has to do with uh, expanding our worldviews uh, that I think it's, is a way in which the Earth Shadow serves. So one is uh, this notion of when the Earth Shadow was launched uh, in the year 2000, the whole notion of how we of non-discrimination of any kinds, including non-discrimination of um, religion and sex orient uh, sexual orientation, which is articulated in one of the principles of the Earth Charter. That in the year 2000, that was a quite new, relatively new approach. Now, 22 years later, it, I would say that the new generation has already pretty much embraced that notion, right? Uh, but that was not necessarily the case 22 years ago, right? In this, in terms of expanding our views uh, and, and sensitizing how we ought to relate to this notion of non-discrimination of any kind, including uh, religion and sexual orientation, right? So I think it has, the Rashara has already played a significant role in, in the sense of of expanding our views in, in that particular aspect. Another one is, and the last one that I wanted to mention is, their shadow starts with a, a pillar on ecological integrity, uh, but also moves to the whole notion of social and economic justice, um, and uh, also ends with the notion of peace. Uh, so since then, um, since two, 22 years ago, the Rashad already articulated that view that peace and the whole notion of, uh, or the concept of ensuring in long and enduring peace was already part of the whole view and agenda on ecological integrity and, and, and the notion of, or the agenda of environment and social justice. So a key, aspect, I would say, uh, uh, a key added value that the Earth Charter brings is this comprehensive and systemic view of, uh, of life and how we ought to relate, uh, again, not only among humans, but with the large living world, uh, which uh, we are part of nature. Um, so I'm, of course, very intrigued and very interested with this new uh, possibility that are emerging with regards to the rights of nature and how the Earth Charter could serve as, as an ethical foundation for this new era that we are living in terms of expanding our notion of rights and, and rights for other beings that, that are not only limited to human beings. So thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. That's wonderful. And yes, I also look forward to uh, for this conversation and learning more about this. So now we are we're going to move to our panel of today. Uh, I am also uh, for those who are here in Zoom, uh, we'll find out if the chat uh, is could be uh, uh, enabled. If not for the moment, if you can use the question and answers a section to uh, interact and uh, send us your questions or comments that would be wonderful thank you and so so yeah so i want to introduce you to 
our moderator of today, and she will introduce our panelists. So our moderator is Francisca Benz. She's from Germany, a graduate student at the University for Peace, uh, currently pursuing her master's degree in Indigenous Science and Peace Studies, which is a very exciting uh, program here. And um, so welcome, Francisca, and I'll give you the floor to continue with the, with the panel. Yeah, thank you, Alicia, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm currently in San Francisco, so a warm welcome from the United States. Um, it's a great pri privilege for me to um, facilitate the moderation today of the panel discussion. And before we start, I would to like to thank um, Miriam for these inspiring words and also already bringing in so many key aspects, for example, um, building a global community and shifting worldviews, turning conscience into action. So I'm very delighted to um, moderate today's panel and um, would like to encourage our global audience to use also the space of the chat. And later on, as Alicia mentioned, we will have a Q&A with the panelists to use this opportunity, not only to talk about building a global community, but already um, going into exchange. And please feel free to provide any resources, any comments and any questions. So, Today's jointly organized webinar by the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and Earth Charter International addresses, as Miriam already mentioned, a very crucial topic. It's a special event and it will create a momentum to examine linkages and to build bridges between ethical sustainability and the recognition of nature rights in the context of a UN declaration of rights of Mother Earth. And a proposal for such a declaration has been um, brought up at the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, who took place um, 2nd to 3rd of June this year. And it was delivered by the Rights of Mother Nature movement in support of the UN in Harmony with Nature program and the SDGs to formally engage in drafting and adopting a declaration of rights of Mother Earth. So what is the current status quo of such a declaration? But also where are the roots and what are the opportunities for the future? What is the vision that drives this movement? Um, with these questions um, that will be part of our panel discussion, I would like to warmly welcome our panelists. And today with us is Catherine Weston. And Catherine holds a Juris Doctor and Esquire. She's Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Ethics and Law a member of the steering committee of the Ecological Law and Governance Association of the Ecological Law and uh, Association and deputy chair and ethics specialists group of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Law. She worked at the Center for Humans and Nature and served as the director of the North American Global Responsibility Program, moreover worked on Biosphere Ethics Initiative. In 2016, she founded the Center for Environmental Ethics and Law. She's globally teaching and involved in conferences to share her expertise and advance new frameworks in, amongst others, law, ecology, climate change, and ecological integrity. With her publications, she's exploring environmental ethics and non-state action, social justice, and amongst others, democracy. 
a warm welcome to you, Catherine. And I also welcome um, Natalia Green. She holds a master degree in climate change and promoted the recognition of rights for mother nature in Ecuador's constitutions. She has worked on the environmental and indigenous agenda and aspects of the Yasuni ITT initiative. Moreover, she's previous, uh, previous pre president and currently vice president of the Ecuadorian coordinator of organizations for the defense of nature and environment. She's member of GARN's um, the Global Alliance for Nature Rights team and secretary of the International Tribunal for the Rights of Nature. Additionally, she's a consultant of the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative and promoter of the collective Frente del Ambiente in Ecuador. Um, as well as she's consultant with the Pachamama Alliance and an expert of the UN Harmony with Nature Initiative Network. Welcome, Natalia. And I also would like to welcome Cormac Cullinan. He's an environmental attorney and governmental expert who has globally worked on environmental government issues who has worked in more than 20 countries. He is director of Cullinan's, a specialist environmental and green business law firm of governmental consultancies, an ACT International and of the Wild Law Institute. Moreover, he's an internationally renowned author. His groundbreaking book, Wild Law, a Manifesto for Earth Justice, played a significant role in informing and inspiring international movement to recognize rights of nature. He spoke amongst others at the climate change conference in Copenhagen in 2009 and led the drafting of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Welcome, Cormac Cullinan. And with that, um, I would like to yeah, warmly express that we are looking forward to hearing from you and would like to close my welcoming remarks. And in the introduction and um, also with this huge pool of expertise um, that is present th through you, the panelists today, I would like to um, first start with addressing the roots and um, the purpose of the initiative, the movement, and that led to the declaration um, on um, the rights of Mother Earth. So I would like to invite first um, Komek to tell us a little bit about the purpose and the movement of the initiative. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. Yes, I, I think that um, one, of, one of the problems that we face in the world today, as, as um, Miriam has already referred to, is the fact that the governance systems in most countries in the world are based on the incorrect understanding that um, humans and uh, juristic persons like states or corporations are the only holders of, of rights and, and all of nature is an object um, and, doesn't, and doesn't have any legal rights. Now, that really comes from an understanding that um, humans are separate from and superior to nature as opposed to being part, an integral part of nature. Now, if we were separate from nature and superior to nature and nature was all objects or mechanism as was believed in the, in the age of enlightenment in Europe, then our legal systems might make sense. But those, understandings have been abandoned by science a long, long time ago. And um, everybody knows that it's not really a subject of debate scientifically about whether we are part of nature or not. Um, we are absolutely, um, we, we like one leaf on the tree of life, which has evolved on this planet over a long time. And there's this extraordinary situation where the, the legal systems are still based on this incorrect understanding. 
So effectively, it's like we claim to have human rights by virtue of the fact that we exist, um, but nothing else has rights by, by virtue of the fact that we don't recognize that nature has rights on the same basis that it exists. So it's like the one tree on the on the tree, one leaf on the tree of life saying we have the right to be, but the rest of the tree doesn't have the right to be. I mean, it's obviously absurd. So the, the real importance of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, which was adopted by a conference of 35,000 people in Cochabamba in 2010, and then recommended to the United Nations for adoption. So it exists already as a people's document. And the, the question is now whether it will be adopt, adopted in, in, or something similar adopted by, by nations. But I think the real thing is, to, the real purpose of it is to say that if we recognize the reality that we're part of nature um, and our, our governance systems are really colonial in nature in the sense that they are oriented to um, control and domination over nature, we have to rethink everything. So this is, a, it's about setting up um, a new vision um, based on uh, an understanding that we are just one life form among many and that we, we all need to coexist and find a way of living together harmoniously if we're going to have a future. And then it's also to, to articulate what that might look like in, in, in broad brushstrokes. And it's very important, I think, to orient, uh, our, to begin the process of reorienting our legal systems so that they aligned with the laws of nature, if you like, or the principles of how the planet, planet works. So, so we're saying the fundamental, we, we're born into an ordered universe. And if we want to flourish as part of that community of life, we need to learn the rules of that community and, and live by them. So it's very important, I think, is starting a process of reorienting um, government systems as a whole and beginning the process of establishing new norms, both at the international level and at the national and local level. Thank you very much. And thank you for highlighting this huge shift um, and the shift of the understanding that is purpose of the movement that we humans, as you said, are only one leaf um, of the tree of life and this huge responsibility and the tasks that um, goes in line with um, yeah, this whole reconstruction of the legal system. Thanks a lot. Um, so with that, I would like to call on um, Katie to tell us about the main linkages between promoting ethical sustainability and recognizing the rights of nature. We're looking forward to hear your perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you, Earth Charter. Thank you, Garn. I think before I start to talk about the linkages of ethics and the Earth Charter and the rights of nature movement, perhaps my linkages with all of you. <laughs> um, I've been part of the Earth Charter since EC plus five in Amsterdam. My mentor, one of the everythings in my life that's made my life everything it is, is Ron Engel, one of the drafters of the Earth Charter, who I'm actually now visiting uh, here in Arizona. And, and so the Earth Charter has been instrumental in my work, in my teaching, I teach human rights law. I teach the law of armed conflict, which has a lot of very uncomfortable parallels with how we treat the earth. And of course, climate law and international law and such. Um, but I'm very, and then with the rights of nature movement, uh, with my work with the Ecologic Law and Governance Association, I worked alongside them for at least the last five or six years. So I'm, I'm close to both of you and I'm so happy to see this bridge being built. Um, and now for, for my question. <laughs> uh, first, I think it's really important to understand what we mean by ethics. Uh, ethics is the exploration into right and wrong behavior when responsibility attaches to any lawyers that should sound familiar. It's the foundation of the rule of law, of justice. If there is a harm, who is responsible for that harm? And how can that harm be remedied, repaired? And this is where we get into the rights of nature movement. Ethics is an exploration, it's dialogue, it is democracy. It is the values that underpin every decision we make or do not make, it's action, it's inaction, it's methodology, it's processes. Also, it's important to see how I view the rights of nature movement, at least with my work and my network. 
for me, for us, it's a part of a bundle of responses towards a more just and effective law and governance for life on earth. Rights of nature, it's an evolution of the theory of justice, an attempt to remedy an unanswered harm, crises, tipping points, and all occurring through the rule of law, or at least through Western rule of law. And I'm talking about the laws as well as the institutions. Uh, RON rights of nature advocates see these unanswered, unremedied harms and attempt to remedy them through this rights-based approach. Uh, give these entities of life, including the organic and inorganic material that supports life, a voice at the decision-making table. Give them standing, let them be represented in a court of law or through a tribal process of reconciliation. Let their cause be heard. Let them get to that next step in due process so that maybe then we can be one step closer to remedying these unjust, unanswered harms. And let me be clear, harm without accountability, injustice, is ultimately what, our, what rights of nature is trying to address. Harm to nature, the continued dramatic genocidal harm to the foundations of life that is happening unanswered. And so, but however, we are using a rights-based approach, a Western approach and a Western jurisprudent, jurisprudential model, the adversarial system. And yet we're expecting by achieving this procedural hurdle, rights of nature in court, giving rights, or at least recognizing inherent rights uh, to get them into courts will somehow translate into substantive protections. But will it? Do not those same underlying systems of harm, those same power imbalances that allow for unjust laws, unjust decisions, don't they still exist? And that is why ethics is crucial to all of this. Uh, procedure is not enough. We must look at the institutions and methodologies that harm nature and the underlying systems and power dynamics that prevent nature from being protected in the first place whether standing or not, whether owning rights or not. Even if we have the text on the paper, the rights and the law, you know, will the harm continue? What else must be addressed? I'm talking about hyper-individualism and statist sovereignty. I'm talking about hyper-competition in neoliberal economics. I'm talking about greed, power, corruption. If we wish rights of nature to not only overcome a procedural jurisprudential hurdle, we must also look for it to overcome the substantive jurisprudential hurdles. We must look to strengthen law and governance itself to even give rights of nature a chance to have a hope within our current rule of law. And with this, we cannot separate our efforts to protect life on earth and ignore the necrophilic governance structures and power vacuums that work against life on earth. And this is so much true for human rights as it is for any rights. Uh, words on paper are only words on paper without the political will behind them. This is why any state obligation to protect the rights of nature must be applied through an ethical lens. This, uh, and so for linkages, reinforce and reinforce and reinforce the fundamental principle of law, the duty not to harm. Any rights must have corresponding responsibilities, the duty not to harm. If we honor that, would rights of nature even need to exist? The duty not to harm. Strengthen checks on the executive, on, on any authoritarian power, so that if one hostile administration comes in, we've adopted the rights of nature, they cannot undo what's been done. Uh, strengthen anti-corruption laws, the power, the purchase of lawmaking and law enforcing. Okay, we have rights of nature on the books, but who's deciding if it's being enforced or not? Strengthen the judiciary, the process of evidence gathering, have them, the, even the judges bear witness to the harms happening to nature and the inherent, to better understand the inherent rights and connections of nature and conflict. And most importantly, and I'll end with this, uh, strengthen individual and state and nature notions of relations. It's what Miriam had said, relations, relational sovereignty, interrelatedness, interdependence. 
uh, that is at the core, I think, of, of any ethical approach to the realization of rights of nature. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for your powerful sharing and very important aspects. And without repeating um, what you have been said, allow me just to address uh, two of them then that stood out for me. It's um, addressing accountability and um, a bundle of responses. Like it points out that this is a complex topic. This is a huge task, but also like the, the activism to um, turn conscience, for example, into action and um, to act. Um, and with that, I would like to give the floor to um, Nati um, to address expected outcomes of a UN declaration on rights of Mother Earth. Thank We you. are keen to hear from you. Thank, thank you, you, Francisca. Thank you, everybody. I'm really, really happy to see you all. I wish I could hug you. <laughs> I think that the pandemic has uh, taken us to be like very apart, but I'm really glad that we can all be together today. And I'm really happy to, to listen to all the comments before. Uh, we have been saying for a long time that, uh, that, that the governments need to acknowledge their responsibility within uh, the, the rights of nature and taking this step forward. We have definitely been uh, pushing that ball along for the rights of nature movement and trying to become a hub as the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature to promote an environment of a, a, a better environment, a more friendly environment that understands that nature indeed is not an object that you uh, exploit, is a subject that you protect. And with that needs to have come a whole change in like public policy, a whole change in laws, and a whole change in how we deal with nature and how we relate to nature. I think that the most important part is how we uh, go back to like a more balanced relationship with nature, because the rights of nature movement is not saying that we need to live an untouched nature and that we cannot that it needs to be apart from human beings. We just need to understand that we are we are nature, we're part of nature, and that we just need to change uh, our relationship that has been so exploitative with nature. So uh, taking that in consideration, uh, as GARN, we have done two things that I feel are very important. One of them is definitely this idea that, that you were mentioning, Francisca, that uh, we have been promoting since its in, in very beginnings from uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the conference in Cochabamba, the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth. And this was presented by the government of Bolivia to the United Nations, uh, but it was not adopted by the United Nations. Uh, however, some countries have uh, responded posit positively uh, to the declaration, and uh, we have tried uh, in past years, for example, with some of the governments of Ecuador, uh, having having my country be the, the only country in the world that recognizes nature as a subject of rights in its constitution, be uh, the country that leads the recognition of this universal declaration at the United Nations level. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, um, even having rights of nature in, 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 in legislation in Ecuador, and even having more than 56 cases uh, of rights of nature, uh, positive cases in Ecuador, we are still uh, living many contradictions in our country regarding, you know, uh, big eco sites like uh, open pit uh, mines and uh, oil exploitation in the Amazon. So of course, those contradictions have a in a way impeded the governments to be leading you know, a, a universal declaration, an effort for a universal declaration because they are not being coherent inside their home. So it's difficult for them to be uh, promoting that uh, outside because uh, that will backlash uh, what, what's happening here in Ecuador. Uh, however, we keep pushing and we uh, we actually in during Stockholm, we actually had a representative from the from the Ecuadorian government talking about the rights of nature and promoting the rights of nature. Uh, he mentioned during during the conference that a part of their, the political policy of Ecuador was trying to include the concept of the rights of nature within uh, the different uh, uh, the COPs, for example, of climate change COPs or uh, the conference of St Stockholm and trying to make sure that in a trans Universal way, the idea of the rights of nature is incorporated. However, we are still, we haven't been lucky to have a country to be leading 
a, a more countries to support the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth. And that is like the first part that we have to keep doing, but unfortunately, uh, that's a, an effort that we can do as civil society, uh, but it's an effort that uh, governments need to be promoting directly. What we can do as civil society is pretty much create like the, the, the baseline and uh, promote more of these initiatives that are happening all over the world. And I'll take advantage and mention that right now there are more than 37 countries that already recognize rights of nature in some way, either as a, as a ordinance, as a, as a law, in their constitution or a recognizing the, the rights of an ecosystem. So a, I call this like an acupuncture on earth because we are trying to heal the earth with all these like different uh, strategies and these different cases that are happening around the world. But that's what we can do as civil society promote it so that it, it becomes viral and that more people uh, are like driving rights of nature legislation in their local uh, spaces. And then states have and should pick it up. And that might take a, lo a longer time, uh, but unfortunately we don't have enough time. We are running out of time with climate change and with this uh, crisis that we're living. And this change needs to come uh, fast. So the second thing that we're doing as GARN uh, is that we have been promoting the rights of nature international tribunals. And these ha have been spaces where we pretty much don't even question the idea should trees, should uh, nature have rights? We are just saying nature has rights, but you as governments are, uh, not recognizing this in these rights. And therefore we have created this uh, civil society ethical tribunal where Cormac, for example, has been a judge. Uh, and we are considering and reading all these cases from all over the world and uh, making sure that we are putting up uh, judgments uh, that are viewed from the perspective of the rights of nature, telling uh, and creating model jurisprudence of what should be done and how uh, how these cases should be dealt with, uh, uh, with the consideration that nature is a subject, is a rights bearing entity. Uh, so those are the two things that we have been promoting, especially from the space. Uh, but unfortunately, a universal declaration adopted by the countries uh, is something that uh, has to be promoted by, uh, by, by countries themselves. But let's not forget that we are the countries, that the state is made up of civil society members, and that is our duty to promote this recognition at the state level. Uh, thank you, Nati. Um, it's great, it's amazing to see um, and to hear um, what has been achieved and getting to know about the um, engagement of GARN and, um, but yeah, also to, to consider the challenges and that this is really a pressing, pressing issue and that we really have to make sure that um, yeah, there is some change and not um, in a few years, uh, just right now. So thank you very much. Um, I would uh, like to continue considering a bit more the transformation and the process while bridging ethical sustainability and the recognition of rights of Mother Earth. And I would like to zoom out again a bit away from um, specifically um, UN declaration, um, more um, in that area of um, nature rights itself. And I would like to invite Cormac again, and we're keen to hear from you, what has been the process towards granting legal rights or legal personhood to ecosystems? Which aspects have been and need to be implicit, implicitly considered to and um, to link it to your work um, to restore a ecological perspective to governance systems and earth jurisprudence. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Francisca. Well, there's been a, a lot of progress around the world and it's too much to sum up here. Nati's touched on some of it, but I think for people who are interested that one of the easiest ways is to go to the United Nations Harmony with Nature um, program website and, it, and they track what, what is happening around the world every year. So the UN Harmony with Nature um, program is a very good way of keeping in touch with that. But just to give a, a, a sort of overview perhaps, um, as, as Natalia has, has mentioned, our, our view is that, is that um, the rights, to, all that is, as Leonardo Boff said, all, all that has come into being has the right to be. And, and everything that has evolved on this planet has its role to play 
in the health and integrity and completeness and beauty of the whole earth. And, and that needs to be respected. Now, so the, the issue is not so much whether those rights are there, but whether we recognize them or not. Um, and it's, in other words, it's, it's a question of removing the blinkers to see the reality. This, this is not an ideological discussion about you know, left-wing or right-wing politics or something like this. This is about recognizing the, the reality that we only exist and are only capable of existing in relationship with the other beings within this incredible community of life within which we have co-evolved. So what's happened? In some countries, <clears throat> there's been legislation. Uh, Ecuador, as Natalia has mentioned, is, is the prime example of the only country within, within the constitution. But other countries like Bolivia have passed national laws which recognize the, these rights. Um, then there have been countries like New Zealand, which have passed specific acts recognizing, for example, the uh, Whanganui River a, a, as, a, as a legal entity um, and national park and various other, other things. That, that is very much being driven by um, the, the Maori people um, uh, being successfully, successfully advancing their culture's consent of, of, of these particular areas. Um, then in other parts of the world, it's been the courts that have taken the lead. So in India, for example, Bangladesh, um, Colombia, the courts have, have made decisions where they have recognized um, the, that particularly rivers, um, uh, but also forests, are, are holders of rights, are legal subjects, um, and, and have, have certain rights. And then there have been many initiatives, citizens' initiatives, often at local government level, um, uh, and even or municipalities around the world where people have adopted anything from declarations to charters to bylaws, which, which recognize these things. But I think the most important thing here is to, is to recognize that we can't solve the problems that we faced, the, the ecological challenges of the 21st century, simply by using environmental law. Because environmental laws um, uh, really just adapt to the existing system. They, they, they sit on top, prop, top of the property law systems, but they don't change the fundamental idea that everything is, all of nature is, is treated as an object without rights. Um, and that most of the decisions that are made in relation to objects are made on the basis of economic considerations, not ecological considerations. In other words, if you're the owner, you can decide what to do with your property. And those decisions are normally made on the basis of whether your profit or uh, in the case of the government, whether it will contribute to increasing the gross domestic product of the country. But, so the criteria for those decisions are, are wrong. Um, we, we need to prioritize ecological considerations um, above economic considerations when we're talking about preserving life, because life, that's what we're talking about. We could be talking about preserving the conditions on this planet which enable life to flourish. And that is more important than, than um, the economy. It's not that the economy is unimportant, but it's not more important than life. So I think, we, I think there's been good progress um, in, in the sense that I, it's popped up all over the world. Um, sometimes it's been, you know, uh, our allies within the Global Alliance have, have driven it, but sometimes it's just, it's, it's arisen for other reasons. But the, the real challenge now is that we have to scale it up enormously uh, and, and, and very quickly. And um, I think it's going to be helped, unfortunately, by ecological crises, more hurricanes, more fires, more floods, etc. because people are going to see that this can't be fixed by tweaking the existing system. We need a completely different approach and an approach which is uh, more scientific and also recognizes the wisdom of those cultures that were good at living, um, coexisting harmoniously on earth. In other words, the indigenous people, because they all have uh, systems which, which recognize the need to respect other beings and to, to coexist harmoniously. So, Good progress, but a lot, lot more to, to be done and, and fast if, we, if we're going to um, avert some terrible ecological crises and, and social consequences. Thank you. Thank you for this sharing. And that also echoes what has been already said that this is really something fundamental. And um, as you just said, um, environmental law is just one part of it and there's much more behind it. Um, and it's about the recognition and about um, different worldviews, particularly the Western worldview um, that has to be, needs to be broadened 
to um, reaccess a relationship, um, a different relationship where the human is part of nature and not the other way around. So, um, yeah, I, at this point, I would like um, to invite the other panelists um, to step in to the conversation. And um, if you'd like to add something and um, yeah, just if there's anything you would add, mention. I think particularly um, the point um, that just has been made about environmental law um, versus the rights of nature. It's an interesting um, aspect. I, I would just like to add, add yes. a little bit, um, just on the crucial purpose of an ethical framework to guide all of this. Um, it, in, in I mentioned it before, but we, we cannot just have ethical words and ethical texts. We must have an ethical process. And too often I see well-intentioned, well, very well-intentioned people with their hearts in the right places that are coming at certain things from sometimes a um, maybe in a, a hierarchical, a paternal. Um, we just have to be sure that with any tool for justice, any tool to heal harms, that we directly confront the systems of the past that have harmed. And this is why I was so happy that Cormac brought up the, just the word colonialism. I just presented last week in Normandy, Normandy, a place of peace on earth, on uh, how we, can we decolonize international law? And this is part of it. And this is why we need a, an ethical framework moving it. Um, where you know it has to be ground up, civil society based, drafted and advanced and evolved. It has to be living, constantly taking in diverse uh, perspectives, diverse voices. Uh, it cannot be seen as just some pet project of the wealthy, the Western, the white. Uh, and I know I, I'm looking at myself in the mirror with this, or even of academia. Uh, it will fail because that's the system that's brought us to today. If we continue that path. So we have to very intentionally act with principles of decoloniality with our approach to advancing any system that supports life on earth. You know, directly, uh, 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 directly confront issues that divide us like racism, sexism, the patriarchy, the heteropatriarchy. I mean, the, and these are all part and parcel of the rights of nature movement, of any movement that protects life. We can't be seen as being in competition with other rights. And that's one of the issues we have to discuss with the rights-based approach. With the rights-based approach are countering rights, competing rights. How in the world can we come together and discuss competing interests and only through ethics, duty not to harm, our responsibilities for all life on earth. Um, and just, just one more point just on, on the colonialism aspect. We can also not put the burden of healing on those we have harmed, then on, on those that have been harmed by the current system. So the fact that we often go to indigenous communities and try to literally in some cases unbury them, uh, there needs to be a process of truth, honesty of the historical harms and of listening and of accountability for our, our own bearing of these people that we're now going to, to try to say, save us, save this, this life. Um, so there's, there's always these governance, historical implications uh, with any path towards, towards life. So I just wanna make sure that, that that is at the forefront of all of this. So. Thank you, Katie, for um, bringing um, colonialism, uh, decolonialism. The, the whole debate to bringing it in, um, very, very important aspects. Um, before we continue, I would like to ask uh, Nati if you would like to share your opinion and would like to add something. Sure, I like point. the discussion of what's happening with colonization because I feel that part of like the most important part of what we need to do is like decolonize our brains. You know, when people keep on asking us or questioning, should nature have rights? 
or you know like are you do you want to give rights to the rock or here in Ecuador remember the debate uh, for the constitutional assembly they said do you want to have like an ombudsman for the frogs or for the or uh, you know and and for the and for the crickets they were saying and it's you know those uh, those questions. I remember an Argentinian woman saying, "Like, then you should go ahead and um, and take a volcano to to a court case if it decides to have an eruption and uh, you know affect the people around them. When maybe the people around them shouldn't have built their houses around an active volcano. <laughs> so you know, just like there's, it's it's very interesting to think that." this idea of like we are the masters and we need to we have we have to colonize and we have to um i pretty much use nature and 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 domesticate nature and when we open our minds and understand that that paradigm is like something that has been built and has been constructed and has been a, a, you know embedded into our system and then it's not true you know it's not true when indigenous people have been a, a, who have like a different a cosmovision of a different worldview a, understand that nature is our mother understand that we are part of nature and a, i'm a, I'll, I'll mention this this again because i I've, I've just read this book from a Suzanne Seamarch, finding the mother tree and it's really interesting you know to see for example how a, and the notion of the of the worldview of indigenous people is being confirmed by by science that the trees talk that trees communicate that they have their own language and that they are completely alive so I think that we're at this point and this stage where you know science is coming together with indigenous knowledge and people are waking up and facing a reality of a major urgency and then the change needs to come uh, urgently. So yes, we need to decolonize our brains uh, and we need to, to move forward to this new paradigm. Uh, sustainable development has not been enough. Uh, and that we have proved that uh, because the idea of sustainable development, you know, has been used in many ways as uh, like uh, greenwashing of many co uh, uh, corporations. And uh, although we have had them, you know, since like the since Stockholm since the first uh, Stockholm conference, uh, and a, a bit before that, you know, nothing has changed. We have just been very uh, resilient to just adapt. To this like capitalist and consumerist uh, uh, model of development, uh, and not really uh, change our perspective of how we deal with nature, but we not have to do that change now. It's urgent to do so. Uh, otherwise, there's not even like a, a, a you know a hope for humanity. So definitely, uh, uh, that is important. I'll, and I'll just want to uh, comment a little bit of, of what Cormac was saying about all these experiences that are happening around the world. We indeed, as Garner, also have like a very detailed timeline of what has happened and what is keeps happening. And we are trying to, when something happens, they like call the people uh, that are doing that so we can integrate them to the movement and we can help them and support them and bring a network. And, and 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 incorporate them to one of their thematic or regional hubs that we have as Garn. But we're also going to launch officially in next October an AG monitor that is an Earth jurisprudence monitor. And that monitor is going to allow us to see all these acupuncture in a, in a map and understand which are all these cases uh, that are happening uh, from all over the world, have a, a access to the verdicts, to the case resolutions, and in that way also um, allow other people to say, well, maybe in, like, in my country, I won't be able to change my constitution, but I will be able to change a law or a local ordinance or uh, give rights to an ecosystem and use the models that we have had already as, as experiences, positive experiences to replicate that around the world. So I think that that is what I, I, I wanted to say uh, regarding all, all the comments. So thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Nati, for your comments. And I would like to stay a little bit um, now still with the theme of transformation and processes. We already have um, heard a lot about uh, this complexity behind and but also this interconnectivity and uh, Nati, you just brought in the um, technological um, yeah, opportunities uh, that are there that we can use. And um, I would like to link it um, to ethical frameworks and would like to invite uh, Katie again, um, putting the question to you um, about 
ethical frameworks such as the Earth Charter with the goal to turn conscience into action. Um, how can, if and how can ethical frameworks contribute to reassessment of nature-based worldviews? What role do they play? Uh, and, and this continues, well, it's all coming from me, so it's all part of what I'm already saying because it's, it's part of me, but that they're foundational. Ethics and ethical frameworks are foundational if we ever hope to realize rights of nature. Uh, not just draft and adopt rights of nature in our legal instruments, which are goods, which are measurable goods, but how do we realize them in our legal and justice regime? Uh, incre incredibly complex questions arise when unpacking rights of nature or any rights-based approach. With rights, like I said, you'll have countering rights. Uh, so how do we address countering in interests between species or even habitats, ecosystems, whether they're man-made or not man-made, invasive or not invasive, uh, harm indigenous or not harm harmful to humans? I mean, how do we how do we balance countering interests? What about the inherent right of a virus, um, of, of systems that harm humanity, um, or, of natural systems? Nature can be, we speak of nature often romantically, but for many, it's a landslide, it's a flooding. It can be incredibly powerful. Uh, so we really need a dialogue around a lot of these complex issues uh, to fully realize. But that's also, I think, justice in particular and duty and in, in not to harm. You know, what advances life on earth through justice, through peace, for sustainability? I definitely, I'm glad Natty brought up the development approach. I think that the, the development approach, even within the environmental movement, is part of the harm that, that we're seeing today. Um, why did we think that an approach that was part of the colonialist model um, would be a solution forward? And possibly it's because it was adopted and advanced by states, you know, states moving the sustainable development approach. And again, very well in, in, well intentioned people in the environmental movement as well. But we needed state support for that concept. Um, and to do that, you know, the development was a language that they were comfortable with. So, but what does rights of nature offer? You know, that responsibility, questions of responsibility and duty not to harm does not already offer. If they're on equal footing and both are failing, you know, we have a duty not to harm, but we have harm occurring. Does that not demand us to look at the underlying systems that allow for the failure to occur? But ethics, it's dialogue, uh, it's democracy, it's justice, it's sitting across from each other as equals, often in a circle, seeking reparation from harms to heal those harms but we need a language to guide that process. And that's where the Earth Charter can play such an important role. Uh, born of civil society, evolving, kept alive through civil society, egalitarian, ecocentric, peace-based approach. That alone is, is novel and good. Uh, blending governance and peace with and for the future of life. And only through ethics can any tool seeking justice like rights of nature attain justice. But I would add that a crucial component for any ethical frameworks like the Earth Charter or any individual communal collective approaches of valuing life and, and governance um, and collecting the collective of a society uh, to build solidarity, that we not lose our particularity, which often help happens on the international law global, global realm. Uh, our strength is our diversity. Uh, this also counters the colonialist approach. Our identities all bundled up in each other is our power. And just too often I see in global care, global movements, declarations, we see anonymity, you know? Um, and I understand the need for that, but I think that's also why we have a failure of some of these beautiful documents on human rights even, the, the recent right to healthy environment. Um, and, and then, Will that succeed um, or will it follow the path of human rights, which are failing? Um, name names, name people, bring our identity back to, back to the planet. Name species, name forests, which I see in the court cases. That's part of the strength of rights of nature. Uh, and in those differences, we harmonize, right? Um, so I, I would just like to add that, you know, not only do, can Earth Charter provide the help with us in the language, 
um, and help with the methodology. Like I spoke before, that it can't be this pet project of academics, but a massive education campaign on what Earth Charter or what, sorry, what rights of nature even means so that people don't see like, I'm already hurting and we have human rights. Now I need to compete with rights of nature. Uh, no, that it's all this sh shared responsibility, the shared governance, um, that it cannot be used as another tool to harm, like we see with conservation, find and fence, conservation, fortress conservation, but that it is a tool to help. And I think that alone could be foundational in moving rights of nature from text to reality. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Katie. And uh, yeah, this really um, outlines again, the necessity of ethical frameworks and uh, particularly the Earth Charter. And before I um, come back to um, Cormac, I would um, ask the final question related to process and transformation and would like to put it to you, um, Nati, how would you describe the Dynamic, uh, dynamics and exchange considering community, state and global levels in the process of recognizing rights of nature? I think it's a very intrinsic uh, relationship. I feel that uh, one of the, the critics uh, about the rights of nature and may, maybe more than a critic, um, and a feeling that we had from some indigenous people was that uh, with the incorporation of rights of nature, this will uh, be taken by uh, NGOs or by uh, experts and, and they will be uh, uh, left apart. This hasn't been the case, especially in Ecuador. In most of the cases, for example, next week, we're going to a court case uh, to find fight against a, a, a mining company, a copper mine, mining company, actually a, a Chilean company, Codelco, that, is a, a, that wants to develop a, a, a mining project in intact that is the cloud forest a, and we're going to the court in the name of two frogs that have been recently rediscovered they were considered extinct and these frogs a, represent you know an, an umbrella a, a species for many other species in a, the territory but we are going to the court a, representing those frogs a, but we are doing that with the communities, with a expert, with a with a team of NGOs, of biologists, of experts, not only in frogs but in orchids, in 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 different 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 type of species, a, monkeys, a, and, and other species that are present in the in the in territory. And we have been able to create these amazing groups of people that can go to court to represent a species or an ecosystem when a, its life is threatened. Uh, on behalf of the rights of nature. Uh, I think that the only case where you don't have that experience is maybe uh, in the oceans when we deal with, for example, the, uh, the, the uh, shark finning, uh, because we don't have anybody living in the ocean. However, most of the cases, except for that one or uh, for marine ecosystems, and uh, deal with people. And we are always combining human rights and collective rights with uh, rights of nature. So uh, about the uh, Francis, the 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 Francisca, the, the relationship that you're asking, uh, it has to be a, a very intrinsic in, uh, relationship. It has to be a relationship between uh, the people uh, on uh, in the communities, the experts, uh, the, the the technicians in in NGOs. Uh, something that we have learned with the experience and with the years in Ecuador is that a judge cannot fail as it used to fail if, for an environmental case before, just with their, its basic knowledge. It needs to fail uh, with the support of many other uh, experts. So it needs the support of a biologist or a, an anthropologist or a water expert of uh, the communities. You know, it cannot uh, understand how and why are the natural cycles of an ecosystem being violated if they don't if the judge doesn't have information from other uh, other uh, sciences so it's very in interesting that rights of nature the rights of nature approach forces us to have an interaction and understand that this as nature is very a uh, varied is a, and it needs to have you know the the complement from many sciences and and the the collective work of people from many different uh, um, a fields of work. So that's very important with the rights of nature cases. And of course, interaction with the government, unfortunately, I, not only 
even Ecuador that recognizes the rights of nature, but other governments are not doing their job. They're not being responsible with the rights of nature. So we are, uh, are needing a civil society to constantly be uh, telling the world and telling our governments that they're not doing their job and denouncing how uh, uh, their activities or the activities they're allowing to happen in the country are violating the rights of nature. And how are we doing that also with interaction with other countries and with other organizations and with other civil society groups that are trying to do the same in other countries. So I think that that's the, 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 the interesting part of this interaction and the importance of the articulation of the rights of nature movement that we need to understand we're talking about the same language and that we are facing a really strong and powerful force that is, you know, like uh, big transnational corporations and capital that wants to continue doing like the business as usual and continue to exploit the world. And we need to be working very uh, harmoniously and uh, um, in, in, co in, in coordination and in articulation to actually make this change happen. Thank you, Nati. Yeah, I love what you said about uh, relationships uh, that you brought up again and community and the intrinsic relationships, particularly, um, that I think is also a fundamental tool to um, loosen the egocentric worldview of the Western world and to um, reaccess a nature based worldview. So, with that, um, slowly wrapping up the conversation, I would like to invite Comek again um, and ask what would be needed at UN level of at the regional, national level and on a global level to recognize the rights of nature? What is needed? Um, thank you, Francis. I, look, I think that fundamentally what's needed is what Marion referred to at, at the beginning, is we have to ab abandon the delusion that we are separate from nature. Um, we have to understand that um, uh, the, the purpose of, of humanity, our main objective, must be to coexist harmoniously with, with other beings within nature, not, not as standing outside nature. And our, our primary purpose is not sustainable development, which mainly means sustaining development. Um, um, it, it is to coexist harmoniously within nature. And once we accept that that's what we hear, that's one of the fundamental, maybe not the only objective, but the fundamental objective of, of, of humanity, then we have to start, start saying, how do, we, how do we do that? And then we start looking at uh, things like what governs humans' behavior. It's, it's worldview, it's ethics, it's laws, um, it's, it's, it's institutions, all of those things broadly called um, governance. And they, they may be internal like one's own ethics or they may be external like legal systems. But we have to reorient all of those towards this um, objective. And we have to ask ourselves, um, and when there's a conflict, uh, Katie's referred to conflicts, of course, rights always conflict and um, the whole, e the, the global ecosystem would collapse if things didn't eat each other. Um, but that the conflict between the, the interests of a lion and the interests of a zebra, it's not, it's not a problem because um, when there's a conflict, you, you move to the higher level and you say, is this something which is harmful to the, the next level up the ecosystem, et cetera. And as long as it's, it, so conflicts are resolved in the, in the interests of, of the next higher level, just in the same way as we, we resolve conflicts of human rights on the basis of what's, interest, what's in the best interest of the society or community as a whole. And so it's not without difficulties, of course, but, but fundamentally it's there. Um, and um, I think personally that um, although one, one, can, one can talk about, you know, in practical detail that you need maybe a, a universal declaration, and it's important to note the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a legally binding document. It, it gave rise to legally binding documents, it's inspired them. So you can start off with something which is not legally binding, but the, the real thing is to shift your perspective and to try and do something different. And once you do that, it opens up all kinds of amazing avenues um, for rethinking everything. And the real point is, is that it's, it's rethinking governance in order to bring it more closely in line with science, as, as Natalia has said, and, and with indigenous perspectives, um, let's call it wisdom. So. Um, I, I think that um, 
I think that although I used to try and work out complicated plans about how one was going to make this happen around the world until I realized I was I was basically coming up with my version of a master plan for world domination and uh, that's doomed to failure and really it's got to grow organically and that's what's happening it pops up in different places and and now I don't try and work out master plans I just look and see where it arises and then I try and support that it's like watching for a a, sh a green shoot to appear in a crack in the concrete and going and watering it and eventually the concrete will crack further and the forest will grow in the ruins of the old so um, that I think it requires everybody to do what they can to to nurture the, the green few uh, the green shoots of a society which prioritizes um, harmonious coexistence live and let live within nature thank you I have a quick sentence just to add to what Cormac wonderfully said. So you spoke about human rights as non-binding instruments moving, or any document as a non-binding instrument moving to a binding. But in human rights law, that's how we see all human rights. They already exist, even without a non-binding document. And it is the obligations of states, of those in power, to write them down, to enforce them. So perhaps that's a, that's a good that we can take to the rights of nature movement. They already exist. It's the obligation of states or those in power to recognize, write them down and enforce them. That, that, we agree, Kate. That's why we don't say granting rights of, of nature. We say recognizing because they already exist. It's just a question of articulating them. Yeah, thank you, Comic. Thank you, Katie. Um, for these inspiring words and controversial discussion. And I would like to um, give the floor to Nati again um, for a final comment. Final comment. Um, you've already spoken about the expectations um, of a declaration um, on rights of Mother Earth. Um, but we're also keen to hear from you what are the expectations for following up on the international meeting in Stockholm. Thank you, Francisca. Uh, I think that we have very large expectations. We are really hoping that this movement will become mainstream. I think that we are still a breaking through the system and it's still a we're still a, a presenting this as a paradigm shifter but people are still very a capitalism is very resilient and a, people are still very a, 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 i will say comfortable with the idea of using nature and exploiting nature and accumulating a products of nature and and, and wealth although you know that a country and that a uh, uh, drives into a uh, inequality and poverty, but people are not thinking about that. They're thinking of how do I become rich and not about who's becoming poor and who and what is a uh, uh, who's suffering from that. Not only a uh, disposable people, but disposable nature and disposable places, sacrifice zones. So. Uh, we need to still change that paradigm. And to do that, we need to become mainstream. So this movement needs to grow a lot. And the perspective that we have is that we really make this like big, huge uh, leap. And, and uh, I will say in, in, a, in a way, go into absolutely every country, every organization, every social movement and incorporate the idea of the rights of nature. I think that people already are already are not questioning any longer if nature should have rights or not, or at least a, more people are a, more friendly, more uh, accepting the idea in a, in a better way. I was very happy to see that in April 22nd, for example, in the rights in the in the International Conference of the Rights of Mother Earth, of the Rights of Nature, sorry, in the Harmony with Nature event that the UN Harmony with Nature program organizes for Earth Day, I was very pleased to see that we had many countries from around the world that we hadn't even heard about uh, talking about the rights of nature saying that this is definitely a solution. We had countries like maybe like smaller countries like Kazakhstan, but we also had not in that conference, but before a uh, president Macron from France saying that this is maybe the only idea uh, that, uh, that, that, that can save, you know, and can, can change the paradigm. 
Uh, so we were we were talking with, with Cormac earlier about this idea that 10, uh, 14 years, or when we started Garen 12 years ago, we said, uh, we use this Victor Hugo's phrase of uh, this is an idea whose there's nothing more powerful than idea than an idea whose time has come. And we said that back in 2010, but it wasn't true in the sense that it, it was a very small movement at that point. And I know, think now that the movement is growing so much that we are actually having difficulty keeping track of what's happening around the world with the Rise of Nature movement. That is definitely, uh, it, its time has come. And uh, what we need is just to foster that movement and support that movement and, and educate more and more people so this can, can go faster and faster. So I see that as a big perspective. I, that is why I, I really uh, encourage everybody who's listened to us to, to join, for example, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, because what we are is an alliance. We are not an organization. We are a hub. We are an articulation of people who want to share their experiences of what they're doing with the rights of nature and, and really uh, take this to all the different corners of the world. So I, I see that as a perspective, and I really hope that we have these champion countries that can really lead the transformation, uh, transformation also at a governmental uh, stage. Because right now, I think it's still a very important idea. It's becoming very prominent with, uh, with social movements, but it's still uh, uh, only showing up uh, at the international negotiations. But uh, it's happening and it's coming. And we need to be prepared to just support uh, that change and, and have that change be positive in the sense that uh, you know, people can say, as you were saying earlier, and Catherine, in, you know, like there, we are, uh, we still cannot uh, guarantee human rights. And now we're talking about the rights of nature. Like, what is this? And it's pretty much understanding that it's nothing, nothing extra. It's just a recognition that we cannot guarantee humans right, human rights if we don't guarantee nature rights, and that we're talking about the same thing. And that it's true, we are not going to be able to change the world in one day. And uh, with the with rights of nature legislation, we're not going to be able to guarantee those rights uh, and the, the execution of those rights uh, completely. But we have not been able to do so with the human rights either. Uh, but that's not a reason not to implement and recognize that nature is a rights bearing entity. So I think that that's very important to uh, allow the movement to grow, to be connected, and that articulation is what is going to allow us to really uh, accompany this growing movement. That is where I see things are going to, to, to happen and that are going to come. And I'm really uh, hopeful that this will be, uh, this will happen, especially because I heard already many governments as I was mentioning, uh, talking about this idea, not only civil society. And I think we are ready or we should be because we don't have time. Yeah, thank you, Nati. Um, I think um, your vision, what you just shared, it's a beautiful place to end. There's a lot of hope, there's a lot of work, um, but yeah, there's a, a lot of efforts that have been already taken and um, there's a lot of motivation and it's very motivating and inspiring to listen to all of you. And I also want to use uh, this point to um, deeply acknowledge indigenous peoples and I know that also some indigenous peoples are um, yeah, online here just right now. And I think what brought up the conversation that including myself as part of the Western world, we can just listen and engage with deep respect. Um, yeah, with gratitude that uh, a lot of wisdom has been, um, yeah, has been kept for so long and um, there's so much of resilience um, that has been yeah and is ongoing and um, yeah just um, sitting down and listening in gratitude and moving forward so um, as of uh, saying this I um, yeah, would like to say goodbye from my side um, it was a great privilege to facilitate this moderation and um, I would like to hand it over to Alicia for the Q&A. Thank you. But to don't leave, Francisca, you can I'll stay. <laughs> we'll stay continue on. to have your inputs. But, uh, but it's, it's great to see that there's some comments and questions as well from, from some of you here. 
and one was from uh, it's from Jessica then Outer, and it says is Bolivia still trying to promote and advocate for this UN declaration or did it leave it be? And there's an, so maybe the three of you uh, can can uh, think about if you have a, a an, an answer, and and then. Uh, there's also one question uh, from Tim Lash, and it is, it's, I'm going to read it, it's, it's a bit longer, but it says, seeing nature as a set of objects has led to a typology, typology of natural objects, individuals, populations, species, ecosystems, and a scientific challenge to define their boundaries in practical exams and in principle. This is in, needed in an antagonistic system of rights and responsibilities to support rights in a relational worldview, a typology of natural relations, typology which is amenable to scientific elaboration in practice and principle and to ethical discourse and experience. So his question is what leads are available toward an ecological and legal typology of natural relations? So, Let's see if, if one of you would uh, like to answer those questions. Uh, okay, there's another one. There's other comments that I will see how to put them live, I think, if, if all of you, because there are some also from Lisi Adams, also Jessica is sharing some, some links, so I'll try to put those, those there, but maybe those two if some of you would like to answer. Maybe, maybe I could jump in on the last one, Tim, Tim Lash. Look, I, I think, I think he, Tim raises a very good point. You know, the, the, the language of rights and duties is relatively crude, and as he points out, can be quite antagonistic. Um, um, it's the language of, of the mainstream legal systems, and certainly the indigenous understandings, like referring to all of my relations, are much more subtle and accurate <clears throat> in the sense that they're both emphasize the relatedness, um, all our relations, and also the quality of that relatedness. In other words, everything's family, you know. And, and I think if you, my experience in, in speaking with indigenous people about these things is that if, if, I, I, I'm not sure they would, would have a typology, but I think that they would say that, um, and this is maybe my understanding, I'm not trying to speak on behalf of indigenous people, but is that what we are wanting to do is to live as human beings in a way that is very present to this community of life um, and that is intimate with it. And so what people say is there's love. I mean, I, people say we, we, we do this because we, we, love, we love other life forms. We love this community of life. We love Mother Earth. And, and that's, that's a form of intimacy. So um, the, the word respect is often used um, in indigenous culture. We must, we must respect other beings, whether it's a river or a forest or an animal. Um, and that's another qualitative aspect of, of interrelationship. Um, and, um, and also the issue of responsibility. You must take responsibility for your actions and the actions of your community. Um, and so that points to the fact that the most important thing is for us to look at our duties to other beings. Rather, the rights are just a way of, of in a way, point, pointing us to the fact that we have duties in relation to other beings. So I, I definitely believe that we need to do more work on looking at the question of relatedness and interrelationship and the quality of, of how we do that in ways that can deepen our intimacy and be informed by, by lo love. Some people call it biophilia. But um, I think that is, you know, over, whether one has a, a detailed typology or not, I think that's what's fundamental to it all. Thank you. Yes, I think, Katie. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, Na Nati as well. I didn't uh, see your hand, Katie. Sorry. I, I just were you speaking to Bolivia? Oh, sorry, to Bolivia or to follow up? Cormier? I was speaking in Bolivia, but you can start oh, if you. Okay. No, you you go Bolivia, then I'll take us back full circle. <laughs> okay. I ju I'm just going to be very very uh, short in my answer. Uh, Bolivia indeed uh, started with the with the rights of nature with the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth in 2010. It incorporated the rights of nature into uh, the the declaration as a law. It has a law for the rights of Mother Earth as well. 
it's, it doesn't recognize the rights of nature in its constitution, but it has these two uh, national laws to promote the rights of nature. And as you can remember during the time of Evo Morales, uh, this was really promoted at the, at the UN level. Uh, unfortunately, this has stopped in the sense that uh, we do know that, for example, uh, this government with the, actually with the leadership of Coach uh, Choquehuanca, the vice president, is trying to promote the idea of the rights of nature, but definitely not with the strength that it used to uh, at the time uh, when the United Nations, with the, with the People's Declaration uh, for the Rights of Mother Earth happened back in 2010. So we definitely uh, know that uh, Bolivia is an ally. Uh, we know, of course, that Ecuador is an ally, although as I was saying, it has like these internal uh, contradictions, but uh, we are hoping and you know, still uh, looking for a country that can be this champion to promote the Universal Declaration and even go to those 37 countries that have rights of nature incorporated in, in their country somehow to be able to promote this idea. And I feel that it could be a success, but we definitely need a, a, a committed country that is um, coherent uh, to be able to lead this. And unfortunately, uh, Ecuador and Bolivia had not, uh, have not been these actors as we have expected. So we're still looking for that and hopefully that will come maybe from one of the, these two countries or maybe from another country that wants to take the lead. Katie. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with love and end with love. I love the question about the typology of, of rights and what we, how I phrase that is the language of rights, of, indi of individual, often individual rights. Sometimes you see collective rights, uh, the people's rights, but even rights has been, for in the US with indigenous peoples, individual rights were used as a tool to break up the relational being of indigenous people. The, it, it was through property rights, but that was a tool for harm to divide and break up the relational understanding that the indigenous peoples in the US lived by. It was, it, so we have to be aware of that history. Um, but I think, so what we do, I love the idea of, and I'm going to think more about it now, thanks to you, this typology, this language of, of uh, natural relations or, re or relational rights, relational responsibilities. Uh, the only thing I can think of in my work that we speak to that is we use Ubuntu, which is this uh, legal and ethical philosophy of living from Southern Africa. Uh, I and it's uh, my existence is because of your existence. It's it's a it's a bundle of existence. I cannot exist without you, and ex we extend that to not just relationships between humans or between human communities, but between humans and nature, and also between states. We, that's where we talk about relational sovereignty. A state only exists because of other states. If they just understood that. Think of the change that could be made to international law governance and enforcement, that we aren't islands, that my harm does travel. Um, so I, I really love what you're saying. And with love, with our ethics work, we speak of the four loves. We say biophilia, the love of living things, uh, local philia, the love of place, your place, um, uh, sociophilia, the love of one another. And we also add a bit, even though there's too much of it, of egophilia. And we have to love ourselves in order to share love. And, and that has to do with mental health, loneliness, you know, just being, um, just seeing the value that we have to, to our relations as well. So I love the question and the comments as well from, from the other panelists. Thank you. Wonderful. So it's a pity that time flies and it goes so fast. It's already one hour, almost one hour and a half. So, so I think we have to wrap up. There were other questions, what uh, I'll do uh, and we'll do as well as, as organizers because we are going, going to uh, share this uh, recording, but we're also keeping some of the comments and links as well that some people shared here. So, so we, can, we can also address some of them and share with you is, uh, important links. Um, but before uh, we close, this has been so so interesting and enriching and also inspiring. Uh, I would like to to close this webinar, uh, giving the floor to to Nati so she can, as uh, representing Garn, uh, uh, give us a concluding remarks. And with that, we will uh, 
conclude this this session. Uh, Nati, thank you. Well, first of all, I, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Miriam and Alicia for for helping us and for for doing this uh, event uh, together i think this is one of the first uh, of many i hope uh, webinars and experiences to educate and to take the message of the right to nature farther i would like to thank francisca for the beautiful facilitation and thank you uh, Kadrin and cormac for sharing the space with me uh, i think it has been a beautiful conversation about the rights of nature and the earth charter and about uh, sustainability and how we move forward with this idea of the rights of nature and the need and the urgency to do so so it has been really uh, my pleasure to to uh, to be sharing this space with you. Uh, as we were saying, we as GARN have the legal, the, the thematic and the regional hubs. So if you guys are interested in joining this a, a growing movement and this growing alliance to promote the idea of the rights of nature, to educate, to educate oneself, but to educate other people about the possibilities of the rights of nature, to understand that it's not, not something that is a, a, unreal and that is far, but it's something that we can definitely promote at a, where we live or at our city or our country or like for our river. You know, if people understood that this is something that can happen and if they are confident that this is something that should happen, then we can move forward with this uh, urgency. So uh, I, I think that I will end up with, like that so we wouldn't run out of time, but I would like to thank the Earth Charter for this opportunity. I, Alicia and the Earth Charter, you guys are part of our advisory board of GARN and I'm really grateful uh, all, always for your support and I feel that we should have more and more uh, spaces of interaction because uh, these two initiatives are so intertwined and we just need to move forward with this. So I would like to thank you all for coming to this event. Well, thank you. And with this, we are wrapping up. And uh, thank you for your time, for your presence to all of you, all the attendants and uh, the attendees, sorry. And um, uh, yes, we, we well, now this is the first event, but let's see how we can move on and, and, and continue. I really like what uh, several of you said that uh, education on this uh, should, should also be, be supported. And so maybe those, that's, those are some lines that we at ECI can, can follow uh, more uh, education and raising awareness on this area. So have a great day, great night, great afternoon as well. And um, well, we'll see you soon, maybe in another activity. Bye, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.